Arthur Griffith would lead the team, which included Michael Collins. This angered Collins, who argued that he was a soldier, not a diplomat. But de Valera was insistent. Was he setting up Collins? Set up is a rather um, pejorative term, but it is true that de Valera himself, in his career, kept his hand on everything. When he was negotiating subsequently with the British, he did it personally. When he was drafting the Constitution, he did it personally. He was a meticulous man. He gave the impression that a lot of these people flying around were doing things with their own bat, but in fact he kept the tightest possible control on his cabinet and everybody around him. And he um, must have known from his, his uh, dealings with Lloyd George beforehand exactly what was there. He also knew from his tours of America, remember he had international experience which the others didn't have, what the weight of world opinion was, what the traffic would bear, and he knew what the strength of British uh, influence was in America and how the Irish-American lobby could be countered. And though he had raised a lot of money, four million or something, for the war loan, what was it compared to the scale of the money England had poured into Flanders mud, for instance? So he knew better than most people what they were up against. And the fact that for once he didn't keep his hand on everything that was happening from a day-to-day -day basis and wasn't the man in the gap indicates that he knew that the gap was going to be very uncomfortable. It was a barn in Wales, and he wanted to stay out of it. In London, most of the Irish delegation party, including secretaries and staff, stayed here at 22 Hands Place. Collins, guarded by members of his squad, including Tom Cullen and Liam Tobin, made his headquarters at number 15 Cadogan Gardens in Kensington. Also with Collins was Emmett Dalton, who had fought with distinction in the First World War, but since then had been a member of Collins' military staff. Dalton, like Collins, was apprehensive about the London visit. Well, we were annoyed at the idea of Collins going at all. I'm talking now of the army, because it uh, exposed him, as you know, to the enemy, and he'd been sheltered up to then. And we were very, he, was, he himself was very reluctant to come, as you know. And uh, this was, uh, it caused us a lot of worry. So it was decided by the general staff that we would purchase an aircraft. Uh, I thought this idea up because I knew two air flying officers who would uh, cooperate with us and who were now in the volunteers. And uh, this was Jack McSweeney and Charlie Russell. So they came over ostensibly from the Canadian government, uh, the forestry department, to purchase an aircraft for watching fires in the forestry in Canada. And they succeeded in purchasing an aircraft, which we held at Croydon all the time. And this, the object, of course, being to, in the event of a breakdown, to get Collins back to Dublin as fast as possible. Mm. Formal talks got underway at number 10 Downing Street on the 11th of October, 1921. At 11 o'clock, Collins and his group entered the building. They were met at the door of the cabinet room by David Lloyd George, who sat down with his team in front of the fireplace. Arthur Griffith sat directly opposite him across the boat-shaped table, Michael Collins beside him. Negotiations would last two months and entail seven plenary sessions, 24 sub-conferences and nine meetings of special committees. Each morning, Collins went to Mass at Brompton Oratory and lit a candle for Kitty Kiernan. Often he'd return to Cadogan Gardens before his fellow delegates had wakened for the day ahead. Kit dear. I've just returned from Brampton Oratory, lit a candle for you. I did a journey of five miles to my sister's place for a letter from you. No letter. Honestly, I felt it terribly, but I do not believe that you failed to write and won't believe it until I know. Goodbye for the day. Tough work before me. Every good wish and thought. My very dear Michael, I wonder how you are doing in London. These any nice girls that you liked? Did you kiss anybody since? I didn't. Didn't get the chance. You know I'm only joking. My love to you. In their correspondence, there were suggestions, too, of intimacy, experienced or perhaps tempted. I love to have you here, but we must be really good. No bedroom scenes, etc., etc., etc. Taken too? There was speculation also, privately and publicly, about Collins' relationship with one of his most ardent admirers, Lady Hazel Lavery, wife of the renowned artist Sir John Lavery. 
Lady Lavery, who would one day grace the Irish pound note, was one of London society's great beauties. Collins frequently visited her home. Well, there's hardly a diarist in London that ever wrote uh, that didn't refer to their uh, relationship. Um, Lady Diana Cooper talks about it. George Bernard Shaw referred to it. Um, uh, but at home specifically, um, the person most close to Hazel Avery was Anita Leslie, her companion, daughter of Sir Shane Leslie. Anita Leslie was her comp companion all her life until she died an old woman. And she told her everything. And she told her of her affair with Michael Collins, chapter and verse. But Anita Leslie's father, Sir Shane Leslie, cousin of Winston Churchill, had a different explanation for those frequent visits to the Lavery home here in London. In the Lavery studio, we brought in Winston instead of a government building. And they all were pretending to be painted pictures. It would have been quite impossible to get any kind of a treaty if it had not been for Winston and Collins and Lady Lavery. We put together the fact that he spent two months negotiating a treaty in London and that probably every second night he dined at Lavery's house, given he was 30 years of age and she was 34, given that his diaries continually mention day with Hazel Lavery, day with Hazel Lavery, met Hazel Lavery, given that Sir John Lavery was 68 years of age and that everyone in London believed he connived at the relationship, given the sexual morals of London society at the time, uh, given the fact that Collins was a very young man, given the fact that she was frantically in love with him, given the fact that every London diarist and hostess uh, put them together at the dinner table, and given above all the hatred she excited in Dublin upper class society when she came home, I'm certain that she had an affair with Michael Collins. But that certainty of an affair is not shared by members of Kitty's family. I don't hold any faith in it. I think if anyone who reads the letters in the book, in the collection, from both Collins and Kitty and the Laveries themselves, would find it very hard to see any truth in it. I certainly wouldn't like to think there was. Or I don't, rather not that I wouldn't like, but I don't think there was any. Collins himself wrote to Kitty about newspaper reports at the time. You ought to have seen some of the papers here yesterday. M. Collins in Downing Street with his sweetheart. The Laveries took me there in their car. Some of the correspondents recognised my friend, but the story was too good. Back home, Eamon de Valera hoped for a peaceful outcome of the talks with the British. But as a precaution against a resumption of hostilities, toured Ireland to inspect the volunteers and encourage recruiting. The British would not agree to an Irish Republic. They would, however, offer dominion status. Most difficult of all for the nationalists, they would have to swear an oath of allegiance to the English king. De Valera would agree to external association with the crown, internal association involving allegiance, no. In Downing Street, Lloyd George threatened the Irish with immediate and terrible war if they rejected the terms. On the 5th of December, the British gave the Irish a deadline of 10 o'clock that night to accept or reject. The deadline came and passed. At a quarter past 11, the Irish returned to Downing Street. They would sign. Some details were cleared up, and then, just after 2 o'clock in the morning, the two sides put their signatures to the treaty. Later that day, Lloyd George and his negotiating team went to Buckingham Palace to receive the congratulations of their jubilant king on the successful conclusion of the treaty talks. In another part of the city, however, Michael Collins was deeply troubled. Earlier that morning, in his room in Cadogan Gardens, he had paced the floor for some time and then sat to write to Kitty Kiernan. I don't know how things will go now, but with God's help, we have brought peace to this land of ours, a peace which will end this old strife of ours forever. This guarded optimism was reserved only for Kitty. To a friend, he wrote, what was a chilling prophecy. Think. What have I got for Ireland? Something she has wanted these past 700 years. Will anyone be satisfied at the bargain? Will anyone? 
I tell you this, I sign my death warrant. The new year of 1922 saw growing division in Ireland about the wisdom of signing the treaty. Meetings and rallies were held up and down the country. Those in favour of the agreement argued that it was the best deal possible. Those against claimed the Irish delegation had sold out. Guns were always at the ready at these rallies and would sometimes be used. He knew to a round of ammunition what they had. He knew he had divided cabinet. He wasn't bereft of sources either. He still had the IRB network, and he was being reported to. He said, as he signed it, he was signing his own death warrant. He knew the bitterness of the Irish and the way they turn on their own leaders and that sort of thing. Uh, history has proved that from the time that Michael Collins signed the treaty to this year, it has not been possible for nationalist opinion be it of the provisional IRA kind or of the constitutional kind, to advance uh, the Irish position any further than he took it. We see that Collins signs a treaty, earns antipathy of Mr. De Valera, but the fact is that through most of that year of 1921, and for the years before that, he was not the person in the cabinet at the time that was in favor of a, a truce or two negotiations that he was very much for continuing as far as they could go in military effort. He organized, was certainly responsible for being a key leader of the ambush effort and the counter reprisals. For what he saw was a matter of meeting British terrorism from the standpoint of what he saw General McCready doing in the Black and Tans, that he responded in kind. But the fact is that by June of 1921, it was his position with that of Mulcahy that they had gained as much as they could at that point militarily. On the agreement, Eamon de Valera said, I am against this treaty because it does not reconcile Irish national aspirations with association with the British government. I am against this treaty not because I am a man of war, but a man of peace. I am against this treaty because it will not end the centuries of conflict between the two nations of Great Britain and Ireland. If the treaty is ratified, the volunteers of the future will have to resort to civil strife to complete the work of the past five years. In my opinion, it gives us freedom, not the ultimate freedom that all nations desire and develop to, but the freedom to achieve it. The Doyle, now meeting in Earlsford Terrace, began a long series of fiery treaty debates. After one session, Collins wrote to Kitty Kiernan. This is the worst day I've had yet. Far, far the worst. May God help us all. But increasing numbers put their support behind Collins and Griffith. At last, on the 7th of January, 1922, the Doyle approved the action of the Irish delegates in signing the treaty. The voting was 64 votes to 57. A provisional government was elected with Collins as chairman. De Valera resigned his presidency. Arthur Griffith was elected to the office. The evacuation by British forces began almost immediately. Significantly, the first fortifications to be dismantled were those outside Dublin Castle. <laughs> 